Welcome to the Ethel Brown Harvey postdoctoral seminar series. My name is Lauren Walker and I'm a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania and I will be moderating today with G.A. Lee, a postdoc at the University of Washington. We're excited to highlight the work of our outstanding postdoctoral members. Today, Lewis Prawl from the University of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania and Harini Ramalingam from UT Southwestern will, will share their research. Each speaker will have a 20 minute talk followed by 10 minutes of Q&A, so please enter your questions in the Zoom Q&A box. It is my honor to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Lewis Prawl. Lewis earned his bachelor's degree in physics from Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon, and his PhD in biomechanical engineering from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, where he studied microtubule based control of glioma cell migration mechanics with Dr. David Odd. As you'll see today, Lewis has built on his background in physics and bioengineering for his postdoctoral work with Dr. Alex Hughes at UPenn, where he studies geometric packing of the developing kidney. Lewis has been funded throughout his career with a 3M Scientific Technology Doctoral Fellowship, an NSF GRFP, and currently an F32 NRSA from NIDDK. Impressively as well as a postdoc, Lewis has somehow found the time to serve the postdoc community at UPenn as a council member and co-chair of a committee for the Penn Postdoctoral Association. And for this work, he was recognized with the Above and Beyond Award in 2022. So with that, I'll turn it over to Lewis. All right, uh, thank you for that introduction. And um, thank you to the Society for Developmental Biology for the chance to present in the seminar series. So I'm really excited to share uh, some of my postdoctoral work on how developing organs encounter geometric packing conflicts and how they deal with them. So uh, my work focuses on um, the process of branching morphogenesis, which forms several different organs in invertebrates. Uh, the goal of branching morphogenesis is to create a tree-like network of, uh, of epithelial tubules. And the tips of these tubules contain structures that are crucial to organ function. So here are three different examples. And my focus has been on the kidney, where the uh, tip-located structures are nephrons, and they uh, serve in a filtration capacity. So ultimately, the goal of this process is to build enough of these structures and tubules for physiological function. This is kidney epithelial branching morphogenesis that's ongoing in a, in a mouse explant um, in, a, in a dish. So the, the epithelium shown in orange is branching into these uh, mesenchyme tissues. Uh, the, the cap mesenchyme is this uh, population of cells that surrounds each branching tip and contains the stem cell population that forms nephrons. There are also layers of stromal cells that separate um, these, uh, these functional units of branching tips and, and mesenchyme. So if we zoom in on uh, one of these branching tips, the boxed region um, shown in the movie to the left, we can see that the branching is going on at the surface. And some of these mesenchyme cells are uh, uh, kind of coalescing into a structure uh, in what we call the armpit region below the tip to the right. And these are going to fuse with the, uh, with the, the branching tip and form a nephron. So all this is ongoing, um, fueled by a signaling exchange between the two tissues. I've shown a very simplified version of this to the right. And there, uh, there's mutual repulsive interactions between tips that distribute them at the surface. So during development, this tip number is going to grow exponentially, which is going to ultimately lead to a limited surface area available per tip, even though the organ is growing. So I wanted to ask, how does the kidney maximize branching and nephron endowment under these geometric constraints? And this is also a medically relevant problem. Um, the, the human kidney contains about 10 to the fifth to 10 to the sixth nephrons, and this number is set at birth. So then if, if, there, if you have a low nephron endowment, this is a risk factor for adult onset kidney disease and hypertension. And the kidney is a hotspot for congenital defects. So these can impact nephron endowment and leave you at risk for, for disease later on in life. Ultimately, if a patient experiences kidney failure, there are limited treatment options, including transplantation and dialysis, each of which um, are, uh, have significant economic and health consequences. So to start by looking at uh, start looking at um, the how the the structure of the organ impacts uh, the branching process, we we took embryonic mouse kidneys at different developmental stages along the branching process, and we fixed and stained them for epithelial and mesenchymal markers. 
So these are just three snapshots captured at fixed zoom of the surface of a whole mount embryonic kidney. And you can see some subtle differences in the organization of these units of tips with cap mesenchyme clusters in sort of a C shape around each tip presenting at the surface. As the organ grows, they become more densely packed and you can start to observe subtle differences in the structure. This bears resemblance to um, these geometric packing problems that are well known in mathematics. Uh, a simple example of this um, is this optimal packings or equal circles in a square shown off to the right. So if you keep adding different uh, increasing numbers of equal size circles to the same square, you're going to have to adopt different packing configurations uh, to optimize the amount of space occupied by the circles and uh, minimize the amount of residual space. So in some of these patterns, you see offsets or disinclinations and long range ordering various kind of different optimal configurations. So we look, zoom in closer at the kidney surface, we see um, the kind of a, a similarity to this with the, the tip, each tip containing uh, an epithelial structure surrounded by a uh, cap mesenchyme cluster, and then these layers of stroma in between. If we, um, we can quantify some different metrics uh, from this. So if we uh, create polygons, such as by a Voronoi tessellation around each tip, we can uh, define a tip domain area and we can trace the, the area of the cap to find how much space is occupied by cap mesenchyme. And then uh, the remainder would be this residual area in orange occupied by the stroma. So we, if we quantify this over multiple kidneys, over different developmental stages, we find that the tip domain area and the cap area ultimately converge within this developmental window. So at about E17, there's close packing of caps and a, a almost loss of this residual um, area. We can also quantify circularity. Uh, this is a measure of how circular the uh, the cap mesenchyme cluster is. And um, we note that at later developmental stages, the uh, the the caps are almost conforming to the uh, area that's imposed on them by their neighbors. So there seems to be some sort of competition that's ongoing for their uh, space available at the surface. So we want to ask, how does this underlying branch structure impact tubal organization and packing? To do this, we can uh, chemically clear uh, tissues and look at the internal structure by confocal microscopy. So this is one such kidney that has been cleared, and uh, we can isolate this individual tip family and look at uh, make a three-dimensional projection of the of, of the structure. So this is a a group of four associated tips that are connected through earlier branch point um, nodes. We refer to these by a generational terminology. So parent, grandparent, great-grandparent would refer to the age of the node. Each of the tips is surrounded by a cluster of mesenchyme cells, and we can see early uh, nephron structures beginning to form and fuse with the epithelium. So it's really a snapshot of all these developmental processes ongoing in, in one set of tips. We can then use this to create uh, a geometric model of, of tip families. So this is a computational model where we simulate uh, a tip family as rigid interconnected rods uh, connected from the tips through a great grandparent that share a great grandparent node. We can use three different length scale parameters to govern the behavior of the system. The first is the node repulsion distance, the preferred separation between two tips or nodes. The second is a lateral XY dimension, where we can vary this to increase the tip or decrease the tip surface packing density. And then the third is this vertical or Z dimension, which is the distance from the tips located at the surface to the great grandparent node located deeper within the tissue. When we create an array of these um, tubule families in a, in a patch of sort of simulated kidney cortex, we can then solve for their positions via energy minimization. So important things to note here, these are all contained within an elastic material that's softer than the tubules. All the interactions we assume are elastic and we're not actually simulating branching, we're simulating, a, um, we're simulating the steady state packing uh, configuration um, at a, for a particular density. So we can then quantitatively uh, match these to, uh, to the experimental data. So if we take this example of images that I showed earlier, we can, uh, we can look at tubal organization at the surface. We can look at this in the model as well. We find that in earlier 
um, developmental stages. Tubules are sort of randomly oriented in space. Um, they have a lot of space around each other. But then as you as we decrease the uh, lateral dimension, we find that they start to adopt a long range orientation along a particular axis. We call this the H's phase because it resembles the letter H from above. We can then um, define things like this order parameter, S. This, this measures um, the, the angle of elongated shapes uh, in a, within a plane with respect to two orthogonal directors. So S equals one would be perfect ordering along either director. We find that this order parameter increases uh, within this developmental window, uh, E14 to E16. Uh, in both the uh, in, in the, uh, the the kidney samples as well as uh, in certain parameter sets in the model, we can also look at previously published data uh, containing three dimensional representations of of branching uh, tubule families and compare these to the model. So we um, we found these different examples from the literature, and we we saw that the grandparent and parent nodes. We're moving deeper into different tissue layers as development progresses. So ultimately, at around postnatal day two, tubules wind up, or the tubule tips almost wind up vertically oriented towards the kidney surface. And again, we can capture this uh, with certain areas of parameter space in the model. So then we can quantitatively compare the model and uh, the, the data again. We find that the Parent branch angle, which is this angle of separation marked phi here, decreases within the uh, within the the range of uh, kidney development stages that we tested. So we can uh, again match this to the model parameters. And an important thing about models, though, is that we can also use these to predict things that we don't see in in our in our wild type experiments. So we wanted to look for packing defects. Uh, if we start at this uh, H's phase, we can then decrease the lateral size of the, the simulation space, and we can find instances where tips will collide with each other, and uh, and uh, this would be like fusing tips uh, within the within the organ. We should highlight these in orange and refer to them as short circuits. We can also find conditions where surface overcrowding of tips will force tips from the surface and we, we we annotate these in red refer to these as buried tips so in both of these cases these are packing sort of uh, defective packing phases that would impair nephron formation because the nephrons need to form near the surface to interface with the vasculature we also find a region of parameter space where as i had alluded to before um, the tubules can shift towards this uh, almost vertically oriented state by closing the angle between them, and this allows for the, uh, the, the surface tip density to increase while, importantly, avoiding both of these defective packing phases. So we call this vertical packing. This led to a mechanistic question, which is how does the kidney achieve vertical packing while avoiding packing defects? So we took some inspiration from an earlier study by Lindstrom et al, who did this experiment where they cultured a mouse kidney that expresses a PAX8 YFP marker uh, that, that labels both the epithelium and the nephrons. And they cultured it at a uh, air-liquid interface. This flattens out the explant, but allows it to continue to branch and culture and, um, and continue to develop. And they found that at this timestamp, which is about embryonic day 15, and these two red circled regions, these are instances where earlier branch point nodes are almost flowing inwards towards the base of the ureter. So this is coincident with a developmental process that's ongoing at this time, which is the formation of a structure called the renal pelvis. And this is the renal pelvis is a dilation of this the region at the base of the uh, ureter, which subsumes these earlier branch points. So we wondered if this node retraction could be linked to this switch to vertical packing um, that we had noted in the model and uh, in the other anatomical studies. So we wanted to come up with an experiment that would allow us to uh, infer these forces on, uh, on a tubule family that could be causing this restructuring. So this is a schematic of uh, an example tubule family. And if we assume that there's a force that's acting on the along the tubule axis, that's this F sub Z arrow shown on the left, we would assume that if you 
if we could uh, detach the tubule from the surrounding tissue, we would we would expect a deformation where the tubule pulls inwards and there's a loss of uh, apparent surface area within a small uh, change in time. So we know that these the, the epithelium is connected to the surrounding mesenchyme through a, a basement membrane. We can use disbase to cleave the basement membrane ECM and uh, check for this deformation. So we can label uh, living kidneys with this PNA lectin, which nicely shows the epithelial tips. And then we can put them on the microscope and add disk space and immediately begin imaging. So we, when we do this, this movie's going to loop. We can zoom in on individual tubule families. We can look at the, uh, the XZ and XY planes. We find that in the XZ plane, we indeed see this retraction of the tubule. And in the XY plane, there's an apparent loss of tubule surface area consistent with our prediction. So then we can uh, make a quantitative measurement. We can trace the tubule area at different time points. And shown here in this example, there's a loss of, uh, of area at the surface, um, uh, the 40 minute time point, and we see the emergence of a, a, vo a void space where the two tissues have delaminated. We can then do this for multiple different kidneys and uh, collect population statistics and make comparisons. So we find about a 25% decrease in, in area following the addition of disk space as compared to an age match control. And we can partially block this effect with uh, inhibitors of actomyosin uh, contraction, blebistatin or Y compound. So this is all uh, measurements from embryonic day 15. We wanted to see what's happening before this node retraction is uh, thought to occur at embryonic day 14. So we repeated these measurements and we found a smaller retraction due to disk base. We could also increase the magnitude of this retraction um, with the addition of calculin A. So calculin A is an inhibitor of the myosin phosphatase, and this uh, tends to increase myosin activity within the tissue and therefore increase tissue tension. So altogether, these are consistent with an actomyosin-based force that's building during the switch to node retraction or vertical packing. So next, we wanted to ask, can we really test the predictive power of the model? Can we induce a defective packing phase that's guided by model predictions alone? We know regions of parameter space where vertical packing occurs. Um, this is when the nodes can retract into deeper tissue layers. And we know conditions where buried tips can occur, which is when this doesn't happen and overcrowding drives, uh, drives tips from the surface. So we decided to test this in these, uh, so we call them cap explants, where we microdissect a portion of the embryonic kidney, um, these cortical regions, and we would expect them to contract in culture. Many embryonic tissues are, are uh, contractile. So if they contract in XY, and if uh, this microdissection separates out the connection to the rest of the epithelium, we would expect that this would be result in a loss of this F of Z, which is the correcting force necessary to switch to vertical packing. So we confirmed that indeed these tissues do contract in X, Y, and culture. And we culture them over 24 hours, so we can move forward with fixing and staining and looking for evidence of buried tips. We can fix and stain. When we fixed and stained for epithelial and mesenchymal markers, we found uh, we could annotate tips as the presence of an epithelial structure surrounded by these cap mesenchyme cells, and then we can annotate their positions in X, Y, and Z. So shown from the on these uh, series of example images and height maps, white arrows are uh, tips that are located uh, at a lower plane than their neighbors. We can then look at these over multiple different explants and annotate tip positions. We find that there are we found several of these in, in uh, the different explants that we had uh, that we had investigated. So the buried tips are shown in red. And when we make an interpolated height map from these these different uh, the the tip positions, we find that these red buried tips are located or are um, uh, appear as dimples within the tip height map. Then when we repeated this with an intact kidney control, 
we found that all tips were located at the surface. So there's a smooth presenting surface without any evidence of buried tips. Finally, we wanted to then bring this back to um, sort of the traditional uh, methods that have been used to, to analyze branching have been molecular genetics approaches, which have been extremely helpful in, in uh, understanding some of the signaling factors that are required to uh, for kidney development and may cause defects. So we went to, to analyze some, some previously published studies. And the first is this really interesting study by uh, Tsebrian et al. They used a, a GDNF Cree mouse line to um, e express a diphtheria toxin in the nephron progenitor pool. So when they induced expression of this diphtheria toxin, um, they could kill off half of the nephron progenitor population one more minute. And allow the kidney to continue to uh, to develop. So they have they have these uh, DTA exp exp uh, exposed kidneys and their age matched controls. The DTA exposed kidneys had um, few. Uh, they grew more. Or they they had stunted growth and uh, fewer branches. And we note that um, compared to the age matched controls, they actually were mapped to this lower order parameter, suggesting that they're consistent with an earlier developmental stage. Finally, uh, there's this experiment uh, by Lefebvre et al, who looked at a gene called Sprouty, which is a RTK signaling antagonist. And this, uh, the loss of Sprouty causes these regions where excessive tubule branching uh, causes neighboring tubules to fuse. And this resembles the short circuits uh, packing defect that we had described earlier. So altogether, Tubule branching and mutual repulsion uh, create a geometric packing conflict uh, that kidneys have to deal with during development. Uh, these branching tubule families need to actively remodel in order to avoid these packing defects we call buried tips and short circuits. And this establishes both classification criteria for understanding kidney development and congenital disease. It also establishes guidelines for engineering functional kidney tissue from stem cells and considerations when you need to uh, replicate these developmental processes in vitro. So I want to thank, um, in particular, uh, the Hughes Lab, my PI Alex Hughes, for guidance and support during this project. Uh, John Viola and Jia Gang Lu were students who contributed significantly to this work as well and have uh, have worked on separate stories uh, characterizing the, uh, the the packing dynamics. I'd also like to thank the MBL Embryology course, uh, students and instructors in 2021 for support and guidance, and then um, funding sources and, and the STB. And with that, um, I'd like to ask if anyone has any questions. Thank you. Really great. Thank you, Louis. Um, so we've already got a question in the box. Um, so I just want to remind attendees, um, you can put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, so, uh, aside from intrinsic, are there any extrinsic factors that influence vertical packing? Extrinsic factors. Um, I mean, I would, I would say that the 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 neighbor effect, uh, I guess, counts as an extrinsic factor, unless I'm, yeah, maybe I'm misinterpreting the the, the question. Um, but the the fact that you have physical forces that are causing the kidney to to reckon with this in the first place. Um, and we know that the kidney has to grow kind of against this uh, this capsule, uh, which is surrounding epithelial tissue. So um, those probably provide some of the uh, extrinsic um, constraints on this. Um, and then earlier you referenced using tissue clearing. Uh, what exactly does the process of tissue clearing entail and what did you hope or intend to observe from it? Yeah, um, so when you're when you're observing uh, fixed tissues and you can't get more than you know a few hundred microns into the tissue, you need to have some way of uh, of removing what's going to scatter light. So if we we use a process called um, uh, scale, which is uh, what I understand is a urea dehydration process that pulls a lot of these uh, water and probably other compounds out that then we can observe the, uh, the, the internal structure of the epithelium. Uh, if we don't do that, we can get, make it down basically to the stage of, of like where the nephrons are fusing with the, uh, the tips, but that uh, we really need clearing to get uh, further. Great. 
Um, so Augusto Ortega says, cool talk. Um, is the time that it takes for the F-force to remodel the tissue relevant? And what would the kidney look like if the F-force pulls too quickly or too slowly during kidney outgrowth? Rates are always a really good question. Um, my short answer is, is I don't know. Um, but if it, if it pulls too quickly, um, you might see the rearrangement happening before, uh, bef just at an earlier stage. If it pulls too slowly, I would expect you would see um, uh, one of those types of packing defects. Another anonymous attendee um, asks, how can you distinguish buried tips from the distal part of the nephron connected to the collecting duct? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a there's a lumen. You can see basically like a little circle where the, the lumens are fusing. So if you have a nephron that is um, that is mature enough to be starting to fuse with the with the tip, mm -hmm. then we could annotate that. Um, some of the markers that we use uh, will will highlight that pretty well. Um, if it's an earlier nephron structure, like pre pre fusion, we have a, a different um, annotation. Uh, Great. Um, I, I have a question for my own curiosity. So you mentioned yeah. in the beginning that there's both um, mammaries and um, and lungs also have this type of similar packing type structure. So how similar or different are the mechanisms? And, and can you directly apply what you're doing here to other systems? Yeah, so I think we would be able to apply some of these principles. Uh, certainly there are uh, groups that have looked at um, similarities and differences in the branching process between mm -hmm three different organs. Um, I think the branching has different physiological requirements that it needs mm -hmm. to fulfill. In the kidney, it's trying to, to optimize for surface area. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you're going to see the exact same packing defects in, in, the, in, in other tissues. Mm -hmm. th those other tissues still have these um, features where they need to uh, repel, the tips need to repel each other, mm -hmm. or um, there's a, some repulsive cue that prevents fusion um, between tubules because that's typically bad um, from the point of view of trying to like maximize the number of tips located structures. Yeah, I think I think there are there are certainly principles, but the uh, the the geometry of this system is is going to uh, be a, a different consideration uh, because like the lung, lungs trying to maximize for kind of volume filling effect, the memory land, kind of the same. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and then um, maybe one last, unless somebody else wants to sneak in here, um, but thinking about scaling from you're working in the mouse to human where the size of the kidney might be different, um, how how similar, how can you extrapolate what, what you've learned to that type of growth? Right. Um, so there's a really interesting kind of thing that happens in, in larger mammals uh, where the the kidneys become bilobed. So that seems to be a way to to increase the amount of surface area. It's kind of just increasing the number of lobe structures. And then ultimately when you get uh further up in size requirements like uh like whales have this have mm -hmm. these reticule structures and so they have oh. many of these uh, uh types of uh like I guess mini kidneys with with um uh cortical medullary structures. How big is a whale kidney? I actually don't know how big a whale kidney is. <laughs> okay, well, um, uh, thank you so much, Lewis. I think we'll we'll move on. There's one question that just popped up, but I think you can answer that um, via um, via typing your answer, um, and I'll pass sure. it over to GA. But thank you so much for a great presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Lewis, for your great talk. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Harini Ramalangam. Harini had her bachelor's and master's degree at Birla Institute of Technology and Science in India, then did her PhD in cell and molecular biology at UT Southwestern in Dr. Thomas Kara's lab. She then moved on to Dr. Vishal Patel's lab to start her postdoctoral career at the same institute. Harini not only has a long list of impressive publications, mainly interrogating the mechanisms of polycystic kidney disease progression, but also has a passionately 
has been passionately involved in teaching curriculum development and mentoring. So now, without further ado, please join me to welcome Dr. Harini Romalingam. Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, my title is uh, Methionine Metal 3 mRNA Axis is Essential for Nephrogenesis. Um, Similar to DNAs, mRNAs can also be biochemically modified. The most common modification is called N6-methyladenosine, or short for M6A. Um, this, in this reaction, a methyl group is added to uh, the sixth nitrogen position of select adenosine bases of specific mRNAs. Um, this reaction is catalyzed by the methyl transferase enzyme metal 3. Metal 3 is a specific um, enzyme for mRNA methylation. Um, the methyl group uh, for this reaction comes from the universal methyl donor, SAM, um, or short for S-adenosyl methionine. Um, S-adenosyl methionine is a derivative of the essential amino acid methionine, um, and metal-3 binds to SAM and transfers the methyl group uh, to mRNAs. Um, the presence of uh, methyl groups or uh, this M6A uh, methyl adenosine in mRNAs was known uh, and was discovered uh, many, many um, decades ago. However, its significance um, was not known until recently. In the past decade or so, um, uh, we, uh, we know that uh, this M6A methylation is uh, altering the fate of the mRNAs by changing their splicing output or the mRNA stability or um, the um, protein translational efficiency. Um, so essentially by uh, changing their fate, uh, this metal 3 M6A pathway is um, changing the epitranscriptome. Uh, now we know the significance of this metal 3 driven epitranscriptomics uh, in um, biology. Um, so it turns out metal 3 regulates uh, normal physiology and homeostasis in several organs. And uh, when dysregulated, um, this pathway um, results in uh, many pathological states, including cancer. Uh, we recently showed um, that uh, this uh, methionine metal 3 M6A axis um, is, uh, ex exists in polycystic kidney disease and that um, this is upregulated uh, during um, um, PKD, a polycystic kidney disease. Um, so by inhibiting this pathway, we saw that uh, uh, we were able to slow down disease progression. Um, so what is um, uh, the importance of metal 3 in uh, during development? And it turns out metal 3 is critical for embryogenesis. Uh, a global knockout of metal 3 results in um, embryonic lethality. And these embryos do not um, progress past gastrulation. Um, so what is uh, metal 3 doing? Um, so in naive pluripotent stem cells, it's required for pushing uh, uh, the, uh, the stem cells uh, into a differentiated state by priming them for differentiation. So when you knock out metal 3 in the embryonic stem cells or in the naive pluripotent stem cells, uh, the cells are uh, stuck in a hyper naive state and do not progress uh, towards uh, primed differentiated cells. So given all this importance in, um, uh, during embryogenesis, we wondered uh, what uh, is the role or if there is any role for this metal 3 uh, dependent transmethylation pathway in kidney development. And in particular, uh, we wanted to know um, its role uh, in uh, nephrogenesis. Um, we just ha had a beautiful talk on uh, kidney development and we uh, uh, Louis was focused in uh, the collecting duct lineage of um, kidney development. Uh, in uh, this, uh, uh, in our project and in this talk, we focused on the other lineage, which is the nephron lineage. Um, and um, so nephrons are the functional units of uh, that are chief excretory organs, the kidneys. Uh, and these uh, nephrons uh, come from these um, progenitor cells called, uh, uh, which we call as a renewing nephron progenitors. And um, the, the progenitors self-renew to maintain um, their uh, uh, population. And also periodically a subset of these cells um, get induced to differentiate so they form these committed progenitors, which then 
again um, on um, mesenchymal to epithelial transition form uh, these renal tubular precursors, which um, give rise to nephrons. And during this process, the nephrons then attach to this uh, beautiful T-shaped ureteric bud, um, and we have uh, then we would have a uh, functional nephron. So this um, process of uh, the renewal and the differentiation of the progenitors um, is the initial um, event in nephrogenesis, and uh, this takes place reiteratively throughout um, kidney development. And as each branching uh, morphogenesis event takes place, this renewal and differentiation also um, um, parallelly takes place um, alongside. Um, so this, as I said, this takes place during um, uh, gest uh, gestation and sometime um, uh, a few weeks before birth in humans and four days after uh, in mice, this process stops and all the nephron progenitors are uh, undergo a final wave of differentiation and are um, converted into nephrons. From that point onwards, we do not have any more new nephron formation. So what the number of nephrons we accumulated up until this point is uh, the maximum number of nephrons we can have at this point. So you can imagine that uh, any deficiency in the differentiation of the nephron progenitors can dramatically lower nephron numbers. Um, and since uh, low nephron number is directly linked to kidney function, um, it, uh, and it could predispose an individual to renal diseases. So it's important um, that we understand this process um, so that we can have, uh, we can understand how uh, we can have a correct nephron number or a nephron endowment. Uh, one way to um, uh, help uh, address this uh, issue of low nephron endowment is by perhaps extending or prolonging this process of nephrogenesis beyond its uh, uh, last stages. Um, so our goal uh, was to understand uh, if any role of the metal three pathway in this uh, uh, nephrogenesis process. So we started our study by first looking at the expression of the uh, metal three pathway uh, in the nephron lineage. Um, so the uh, human nephrogenic atlas uh, shows that um, metal three mRNA is expressed uh, in um, as a gradient along the nephron lineage, um, and there is. Uh, expression in the progenitors, but there is a higher and highest expression in these uh, differentiated uh, uh, induced nephron progenitors. Um, so we looked at the expression of metal 3 using a well-validated antibody in mouse kidneys, and uh, but, um, we found that, again, uh, similar to uh, what was uh, seen in the humans, uh, we see that there is uh, increased metal 3 expression in um, uh, the differentiated tubules. And looking at a metal 3 activity, um, we found that through our in vitro experiment where we can grow cells, uh, these renewing nephron progenitor cells or grow them as induced progenitors, we found that these uh, induced progenitors had more M6A uh, mRNA levels. Um, and further, um, the precursors for the M6A reaction, the SAM levels were also increased in the induced nephron progenitors. Uh, so this suggests that this methionine SAM metal 3 M6A pathway is activated during differentiation. And it begs the question is, does this pathway then promote differentiation? So we tested this um, by doing a functional loss uh, or gain um, in the uh, progenitors by taking three different approaches. So first, uh, we did a genetic uh, uh, loss or gain approach, and then we did a pharmacological manipulation. And then uh, third, we did a nutritional manipulation um, to test if this methionine metal 3 mRNA methylation axis promotes NP differentiation. Um, so first, um, we took these uh, embryonic kidneys at E12.5, and we grew them in ex vivo cultures. And you saw these, uh, these beautiful videos of how these uh, kidney um, collecting ducts now branch. And, and as I mentioned, at each branch point, uh, the um, mesenchyme, uh, the nephron progenitors surround the ureteric butt tips. And then at this armpit region, uh, the differentiated tubules form. 
Uh, while you see uh, about two, uh, roughly two um, differentiated tubules at the armpit of each ureteric bud tip, um, when we grew these kidneys in methionine depleted media, we did not see any differentiated tubules. But the progenitors, the nephron progenitors surrounding the ureteric bud were still present. Uh, by doing a second method of inhibiting a metal 3 activity, um, of, uh, we used this in, uh, inhibitor, the STM2457, um, and we found that uh, similar to a methionine depletion, depletion state, uh, the inhibition of metal 3 um, resulted in a loss of differentiation. However, um, the nephron progenitors were still present surrounding the ureteric bud tips. Uh, now then, we um, knocked out metal 3 using a floxed mouse in the nephron progenitors using the 6-2 cream mouse. Um, and uh, we found a similar loss of differentiation um, phenotype. So there is no um, differentiating tubules at the ureteric bud tips. However, there are um, nephron progenitors surrounding um, um, the ureteric buds. So uh, this tells us that by ablating metal three, uh, there is a block in differentiation. Um, and when we looked at these kidneys at birth, um, as you would uh, uh, think, the uh, kidneys were smaller. And uh, looking at them uh, for nephrons, we found that there was about, the, these kidneys were hypo, uh, uh, had hypoplasia, and there was about 70% reduction in uh, the nephron numbers that we measured by counting the number of glomeruli, um, which is the most terminally differentiated structure of the nephron. Uh, so this um, tells us that by blocking the uh, methionin uh, metal 3 M6A axis in the nephron progenitors, um, we have reduced differentiation. So then what happens if we activate this uh, transmethylation pathway? Um, so we did this uh, by using, um, by overexpressing metal 3 in the nephron progenitors using a transgenic mouse using the same 6 to cream mouse. We saw that there was precocious differentiation taking place, and in the place where there should normally be only nephro renewing nephron progenitors present, we saw uh, expression of differentiation markers. And um, con uh, as a result uh, of precocious differentiation, by birth, these kidney uh, ureteric butt tips uh, were uh, naked, meaning they did not have uh, nephron progenitors. Um, so this then tells us that if we overexpress metal 3 in uh, uh, the nephron uh, progenitors, we have um, precocious differentiation and loss of nephron progenitors. Um, we then um, tested uh, if over um, uh, activating this pathway um, through a pharmacological approach uh, by using a, uh, an activator of uh, metal 3 or by uh, supplementing uh, with SAM, um, can we see a promotion of differentiation? Um, so again, we resorted to our ex vivo cultures and um, uh, we found that uh, by treatment with the activator or with SAM, uh, there was a similar precocious differentiation. Um, and these uh, progenitors uh, um, were absent um, and the ureteric butt tips were naked. Uh, this is similar to this uh, overexpression of metal 3 uh, using the transgenic method. Now, um, interestingly, when we had a low activation um, with the activator or with the SAM, uh, we saw that there was more tubules uh, with a concomitant uh, increase in the kidney branching morphogenesis, and also uh, with an increase in the number of nephron progenitors, uh, in the, um, uh, the total number of nephron progenitors. Um, so, this uh, made us wonder if maybe similar to the, uh, uh, um, the naive pluripotent stem cells, metal three activity here is uh, to prime these uh, renewing nephron progenitors uh, into a um, committed cell state. And it's those cells that are being expanded, resulting in a larger kidneys with more renal tubules. Um, to test this, um, we took uh, 
um, postnatal day one pups, mouse pups, and injected them um, either with the activator or with SAM um, every day for three days, and then looked at them um, uh, on day four. Remember, by P4, uh, P4 is the last day of nephrogenesis, and the next day, um, the kidneys do not have nephron progenitors, and there's no more de novo nephrogenesis. Um, so we um, injected uh, these uh, pups with vehicle or uh, these treatment conditions and looked for um, the presence of more progenitors uh, and whether they were in a committed state. Um, so at the, true to our hypothesis, we found that with the treatment, there was more um, um, 6-2 GFP expressing nephron progenitors uh, with the metal three activator treatment or with uh, SAM treatment. So this tells us that while in a normal kidney by P4, uh, we are at the route of losing the progenitors. Whereas when we activate the pathway, the, uh, the uh, MMM axis, uh, we see um, a continued uh, presence of these progenitors and um, th that maybe we are extending um, this nephrogenesis. Then um, we looked at, took these kidneys and uh, looked at them um, uh, closely at singular niche and uh, um, also looked at the expression of um, the, the co-expression of the differentiation marker PAX8 and uh, the 6-2 uh, uh, GFP expression. And we found that while in the controls, um, the uh, progenitor cells had uh, uh, almost no expression of PAX-8, um, more than 50% of uh, the uh, niches in the treatment groups had um, PAX-8, low PAX-8 expression and uh, uh, 6-2 GFP expression, suggesting that uh, the progenitors that we are expanding are in a committed state, uh, or in other words, uh, activation of this axis is uh, expanding uh, committed cell uh, uh, population. Um, so um, this the, tells us that uh, we, um, metal three is promoting um, a, commitment of these renewing nephron progenitors and we have uh, more differentiation. Um, so the, then the next question we really wanted to know was whether these uh, extra number of progenitors, do they really contribute to the overall uh, nephron endowment? Um, so to test that, we um, looked at a different cohort of uh, similar mice uh, and looked at them at a later stage of P10, a postnatal day 10, by which stage all uh, the um, progenitors should have converted into uh, functional nephrons, uh, or at least into uh, glomerulized structures. Um, so at, by P10, we found that uh, the treatment groups uh, had more uh, number of glomeruli, and further, these uh, uh, kidneys uh, were able to um, have a higher um, EGFR or um, glomerular filtration rate, suggesting that these kidneys are able to uh, function better. Um, so uh, this brings me to the conclusion um, that we have identified uh, a novel um, epitranscriptomic pathway in uh, during nephrogenesis in uh, uh, the kidney. Um, and this uh, metal 3 dependent uh, path, transmethylation pathway promotes differentiation um, and is required for uh, uh, differentiation and proper nephron number um, and endowment. Now, um, if we activate this pathway, um, we can have uh, more, uh, we can extend or prolong nephrogenesis, um, which results in um, more uh, nephrons and a better functioning kidney. Um, with this, I would like to uh, thank uh, my mentor, um, Vishal Patel. Uh, we are a lab who's primarily focused on polycystic kidney disease. Uh, I'm a quite happy um, and uh, fortunate uh, that uh, Vishal was allowing me to work on this project. Uh, and uh, I would also like to thank members of our lab uh, who's greatly uh, helped me in um, bring this uh, story, um, uh, take the story further. I'd like to thank uh, summer uh, interns who've uh, helped me throughout. 
uh, their internship, and also our collaborators, um, Tom, uh, who is also my PhD mentor, uh, members of his lab, um, and um, Chris, um, and uh, our funding resources. And um, with that, uh, thank you all uh, for listening, and thank you, SCB, for giving me this wonderful opportunity to uh, showcase my work. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Harini. Um, yeah, so there is a question already came in. Um, and I would like to remind everybody that you can put your questions in the chat or the Q&A. Um, so Daniela Ro Rochenovich, I'm sorry if I pronounce your name wrong, um, asked, are there any identified environmental factors discovered that affect the ablation of um, metal no, transfers? It's such a great question. So um, it metal three um, being able to um, convert uh, uh, the uh, information uh, from methionine, the amino acid into uh, tubules. So one of the uh, really important factors is uh, um, the uh, poor uh, nutrition or any uh, uh, poor nutrition or any caloric restriction in the mother. Uh, so like, uh, and uh, during, and it's all this, all of this takes place during gestation. If the, uh, the mother is uh, having a low methionine or a low calorie diet, then that's going to uh, uh, be sensed, I, I guess, in some sense, but sensed by metal three, and uh, because of which we're going to have less methylation, resulting in less uh, um, um, differentiation and low nephron endowment. I hope this answers your question. So um, we have another question uh, from Viraj Dodihal. Um, nice talk. Do we know what transcripts get methylated? Yes. Um, so we uh, did a uh, M, um, M6A pull down to uh, find out what the targets are. And as we predicted, um, the targets are uh, different, some of the uh, known differentiation uh, um, mRNAs, uh, like beta-catenin is one of the targets, and I'm, I'm working on um, trying to uh, validate it, uh, do some functional assays to show that it's it's in the same uh, axis uh, downstream of metal-3. Uh, and we also find uh, um, the uh, my mRNA, pro just general uh, um, mRNA processing um, transcripts um, that we for example, the splicing factors and uh, uh, transcription regulators. Great. Um, Whitney Edwards also asked, uh, do you know which transcripts are directly regulated by metal yes. three during kidney development? I think that's a very similar question. Yeah. Yes. Uh, there's one more thing I would like to add. So we, um, which uh, uh, we also identified a uh, gene called LRPPRC, which I'm quite excited about. Um, so this is a mitochondrial gene. Um, it's required for uh, uh, increased mitochondrial activity. And we find that uh, uh, this, uh, um, MR, the mRNAs of this is uh, normally in a normal kidney is activated uh, or its expression pattern is similar to metal three. And uh, when we uh, did a pull down in our knockouts, uh, we found that uh, this, uh, this mRNA was hypomethylated and in the transgenics, it was hypermethylated. Uh, and uh, when, and this is, especially interesting because um, this gene, uh, LRPPRC, being a oxidative phosphorylation regulator um, is, um, is, looks like would be necessary for um, driving uh, oxidative phosphorylation that we know happens during uh, the differentiation process uh, in the nephron progenitors. I'd like to ask one question. Do you know anything um, that is upstream of SAM um, metal three or how SAM, SAM levels can be? Um, oh, so what is uh, upstream of SAM? So that's a great question. And that's something I'm very interested in finding out. Um, so uh, I have several hypotheses, but uh, really um, SAM, um, the way we can get SAM is from getting uh, from a methionine, right? And the enzyme uh, that 
uh, MAT 2A or 2B are also expressed in a gradient similar to how metal 3 is expressed. So this enzyme is uh, that's producing SAM is also uh, expressed more during differentiation. Um, so then that uh, makes us wonder then how can, um, why or how is there, is there more methionine in the differentiating cells and how can there be more methionine? Um, so we don't know. Uh, we don't know if there is increased uptake of methionine in these cells uh, or if methionine is being taken up uh, through the uh, one carbon cycle. We don't know. Um, but what we do know is as these progenitors are being dif are differentiating, uh, there is more uh, vascularization taking place in those regions. So perhaps uh, from the blood, there is uh, more, mm, you know, uh, methionine or the source for methionine, uh, metabolic source for methionine is, uh, uh, you know, taken up by uh, these cells. So that's awesome. something it's very intriguing. Great. Yeah. As a follow-up, um, if you give dietary restrictions or supplementations, do you mm -hmm. see a difference as the genetic uh, results? That, yes. Uh, so, uh, so far, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, link showing that if there's poor mal maternal malnutrition, uh, then there is a, a, a low nephron endowment. It's been quite well established uh, right at this time point. And it's also shown, uh, this is really uh, interesting uh, uh, recent research showing that if there is a low um, caloric restriction, if uh, now these, uh, uh, the, if there is a uh, methionine uh, supplementation, then it completely rescues uh, the low, uh, the effects of low caloric, res uh, caloric restriction. So basically now there's methionine and we see that methionine is working through this transmethylation pathway that's dependent on metal three. Um, so was that your, I think there was another part to your question. Um, that was, that was, that was um, your question. Yeah, yeah. 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 I would like to know uh, what would happen if we uh, uh, embryonically activate uh, uh, this, this axis, um, you know, will that result in more uh, nephron endowment? Yeah, thank you. Really, really thank interesting. You. Okay. So everybody, please join me to thank today's speaker once again, Luis and Harini, for the excellent talks. And um, this seminar has been recorded and will be available on the SDB website next week. Please join us for the next month's seminar on Friday, May 12th, when Elisa Jang from Stanford University and Stanley Michikanai from University of Colorado will present. Thank you all for coming.